Welcome back to the Get Loved Up podcast, your number one resource for inspiration and motivation to live your purpose, make healthy living a priority, and thrive doing what you love. I'm your host, Koya Webb, a small town girl who chased her dreams and caught them, a former track and field athlete who healed using spirituality and yoga, and an entrepreneur who didn't let sexual assault racism and insecurities dim her light. And now it's your turn to allow these episodes with some of the top voices in spirituality, wellness, and entrepreneurship to inspire you to thrive. Let's get loved up together. Brian Terry is a James Beard NAACP Image Award winning chef, educator, and author, but known for his activism to create a healthy, just, and sustainable food system. He is editor in chief of Four Color Books, an imprint of Pigeon Random House and Ten Speed Press. And he is a co principal and innovation director of Zimmy, a creative studio he founded. Since 2015, he has been chief in residence at the Museum of African Diaspora in San Francisco, where he creates public programming at the intersection of food, farming, health, activism, art, culture, and the African diaspora. His forthcoming collection of recipes, art, and stories entitled Black Food will be published by Four Color Books, 10 Speed Press in the fall of 2021. In regard to his work, Bryant's mentor, Alice Waters, says, Brian Terry knows that good food should be an everyday right, not a privilege. San Francisco Magazine included Bryant among the 11 smartest people in the Bay Area food scene, and Fast Company named him one of the nine people who are changing the future of food. Brian graduated from chef's training program at the Natural Gourmet Institute for Health and Culinary Arts in New York City. He is a former PhD student who holds an MA in history with an emphasis on the African diaspora from NYU. Here he studied under historian Robert D.G. Kelly, and he lives between Oakland and Napa Valley, California with his wife and two daughters. Brian! Hi. <laughs> it has been, y'all, just so y'all know, just for some context, it is, this is our second time <laughs> filming this episode. Our first conversation was absolutely amazing. I don't know if we can top it, but uh, I wasn't recording. So we had to do it again. And it's so hard because, you know, Brian's in high demand. So I'm um, sorry to get him back on, but I got him here for you. And I just want to start off with like so much has happened since we even talked last and we're in the middle of Black History Month. So can you share a little bit about what's going on in your world right now before we dive into your <laughs> Right now, um, well, to underscore your point, a brother is in high demand. I think I have 20 events for Black History Month. And the funny thing is that I literally am still getting requests this week and we're in Black History Month. So that shows me the level of preparation and planning uh, and for for sight, forethought, or whatever that these people are putting into Black History Month programming. So, anyway, um, you know, <laughs> people people who come to me this late in the game, they got to get the um, the tardy tax. So, you know, I'm excited. Uh, I have to admit, I was feeling a little anxious over the weekend because. There was a part of me that just felt like, you know, did I just take on too much? I'm doing so many events um, and I'm just tired of virtual events. And most of them are virtual. I'll do uh, a couple that'll be in person. But then I had to just kind of reimagine what this next month will look like. And, you know, inspired by one of the businessmen who inspires me a lot, Kevin Hart, um, because of his work ethic, his hustle, his business acumen, you know, I just said, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to reimagine this next month as my tour. I'm going to be on tour. I'm going to be in training mode. I'm not going to be staying up late and kicking it. I'm going to be getting like lots of rest, hydrating, exercising, um, ensuring that mind, body, and spirit are intact so that I can really just be present and strong for this next month. And uh, we're off to a good start. I'm excited. Mm, That's so beautiful. And I'm glad you mentioned so much self-care and how important that is because 
I definitely celebrate Black History Month every month. And if you waited till this month to contact me, you're probably contacting me for next year. Um, And I found the same thing. It's been very important to exercise your no and know your healthy boundaries and what you can and cannot do because it is really easy for those saying, oh, we're not doing anything for Black History. We need to find someone last minute. And then it put they don't understand that that puts stress then on you to turn around content or make yourself available. And so I'm glad that you're like, I have to take care of myself and make sure I know exactly what I can do. I think that's such great advice for anyone out there at any time of the year when you're in high demand and things are coming in. You don't have to say yes to everything. And for everything you do. You need some self-care to match that energy that you're giving out. And I just love, love, love that you spoke to that and love Kevin Hart, too. I think Kevin Hart is an example of how you can do you can grind at a high level, but also make time for your family and your friends and just living um, a, a high demand lifestyle and what that looks like. So, yes, thank you for those tips and inspiration. I think that's powerful. Definitely. I, I'll say in terms of just this trajectory during the shelter in place, uh, you know, this public health crisis that started in 2020. One of the things that I was clear about, you know, being home with my whole family, my wife was working from home. The kids were doing distance learning for a minute. And I just was like, you know what? There are a couple of non-negotiables in this period. And one of them is my physical activity. And that was really inspired by um, a few people, but Kevin Hart was certainly um, one of the main ones because that is just one of his non-negotiables. He's up every day, you know, an hour, an hour and a half before doing everything else in the gym, getting it in. And so for me, I was like, I have to have, you know, my 45 minutes. So, and then I started doing CrossFit. And so Kevin Hart and this other brother, Salima Masakila, um, he's the son of Hugh Masekela, the late South African um, jazz musician. And so both of them, they just inspired me to like get on my grind. And I, I feel like the body often leads everything else. You know, when I started um, really clicking into that physical activity routine, I just think that it helped to reorder everything from, you know, just mind, body, spirit. It all, it's all connected. So it's been... Um, It's been a taxing uh, two years, but it's also been um, just exciting to see how I can reinvent myself when I, um, you know, put my mind to it. I love that. I absolutely love that. And would you mind sharing what else? I know you mentioned sleep and I know you mentioned, you know, workout. What are some other non-negotiables that you're doing at this time to make sure you stay at 100? I think the overarching theme that is just the way that I'm living and the way that I want to live the rest of my life is being a happy, easy, fun, um, and loving husband and dad, you know, when things are right with my wife and my kids then everything is right. And then when things are awry with my family and, you know, that isn't in order, then it makes everything else. It throws everything off. And so, that's just the first thing. And that's, that's one of my daily mantras is um, I'm a happy, fun, easy, easy going, loving husband and dad. And, um, you know, I think my morning routine is definitely important. Um, I don't think I know my morning routine is important. So getting up and, you know, starting off with my hot water with some apple cider vinegar, I usually do intermittent fasting. So I probably, um, don't eat until around 11, 1130. I'm just spending the morning, you know, just hydrating, um, doing my physical activity. So either getting in my 45 minutes of cardio or, uh, going, going to the gym to do CrossFit, uh, my daily affirmations when I'm here working out, I have this, uh, daily affirmation, uh, video that I listen to. And it's just like 20 minutes of, affirmations about being abundant, about being joyful, about, um, you know, really manifesting the life that I want to manifest. Uh, what else? You know, I strive to do this. It can be challenging, but eight hours of sleep is one of my, my best. I mean, I can do seven, but anything less than that, I'm grumpy and just not feeling 100. So really trying to get uh, ample sleep 
Um, I've been taking this CBD supplement at night, which has been great for helping me to just settle my nervous system and get some good REM sleep. Uh, what else? Talking to my parents. I probably talk to my parents like every day, you know, I'll have a call, um, mostly with my dad, but you know, I, I often will talk to, I mean, I talk to my dad every single day and I talk to my mom yeah. maybe every, every other day, but it's just so great, uh, connecting with my parents because they live across the country and I haven't seen them in like, I don't know, maybe like six months now, but before that it was, um maybe like a year because of covid and everything so uh is there anything else mm, you know just eating eating well eating like high protein meals uh very few simple carbs uh lots of local sustainably grown vegetables um fruits that i like so yeah that's kind of the routine I love that. Your wellness game is on point. I love that. And and what about spirituality? I mean, how is how are you grounding in um, spiritually um, to keep you in that balanced state for your family and your work? Yeah, I, you know, at least five minutes of sitting every day. You know, I, I love to get in like 15 or 20 minutes of meditation. But when I meditate in the morning, like it just changes the nature of my day. Like I can tell you at the end of the day, just by how things were flowing or not flowing, if I meditated or if I didn't meditate that morning. And it's important for me to just really stay connected to my mindfulness practice. You know, I've been um, a Buddhist or practicing Buddhism since I guess 2000 six when my wife and I met. Um, she had been practicing in the tradition of uh, Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh, who recently passed away. And um, the, the book that she gave me that introduced me to his work and this um, particular form of Buddhism was uh, Jesus and Buddha as brothers. And it was really powerful because I grew up Roman Catholic, you know, had walked away from that religion a long time ago, like when I was in high school, <laughs> but um, to my parents' dismay. And, you know, I think that book was great for helping me to heal some of the trauma that I had um, encountered because of Christianity and Catholicism. And it also just really helped me further understand that most of these world religions, when you strip them down of the politics and history and the BS, they're essentially saying the same thing. And so, um, you know, the, the, cool, the cool little story is that my wife and I, um, we met, well, yeah, the night we met was through mutual friends. And we went to this thing, which is a San Francisco institution. It was started in the sixties and it's called the exotic erotic ball. And my big brother and homie Waylon, you know, he had told me, cause I had just moved from Brooklyn to the Bay area. And I was dating this woman for a couple of years who was living here in Oakland and I was living in Brooklyn and we were going back and forth. And then I moved out here and we like moved in like in I guess it was what April of that year and then we broke up in August and so I'm like oh man I moved across the country and I'm in a relationship <laughs> and now I'm just like and I was very clear that that relationship could not be the only pull factor that brought me from the east coast out here and so I was prepared for whatever happening and but it was still a little disconcerting and so, you know, um, I was just feeling a little down and just, you know, wasn't in a good place. But my friend was like, man, you got to come to this thing. It was it, it happens every year in October. He's like, you got to come to this exotic erotic ball. It's like all this crazy stuff. It's like human petting zoos and, you know, S&M stage and strippers. And I was like, OK, you know, sure. It's a San Francisco institution. I just got to check it out to say I've done it. Um, it was disgusting. I'll put it like that. I was like, this is not as sexy <laughs> as you made it sound. But um, the woman he was dating at the time, um, my friend Alicia, she was good friends with my wife and my wife came and it was a group of about nine of us. And I barely said anything to um, my 
wife that night. I was just kind of, because, you know, the thing about this thing is like everyone, the women are wearing like lingerie and all this cool stuff. And the guys are just wearing street clothes. So I don't want to come across some perv. So the whole night I'm just like, oh, yeah. How y'all doing? Yeah, good to meet you. And I'm just like, I was like <laughs> straight edge. So fast forward to the end of the year. She had had a rough year. Her grandmother, with whom she was really close, passed away. And, and you know, she wanted to end the note, the year on a quiet and mindful note. And so did I. And there was this Buddhist um, monastery in the Bay Area that I wanted to go to, but their programming was full. And so she was like, look, I'm going to this monastery down in um, Southern California. Um, you should check it out. But to be clear, we're just going to do our work. You do your thing. I'm going to do my healing and do my work and then you know we could be friends and buddies when we get back to the bay area we went down there as friends and it was so beautiful because we really got a chance to you know see each other in our most vulnerable see each other naked in terms of like you know she was doing a lot of processing and crying i was doing a lot of processing and crying and it was so cool getting to know each other outside of like the you know kind of pretensions and the performance of dating and we you know, got to know each other. We're hanging out, meditating together. We were going running together. And then New Year's Eve, we went to, because we were there for a week. So New Year's Eve, I was like, well, let's go to this, up this hill where we typically meditate and we can just see all the fireworks over San Diego. And, um, you know, it was just so kind of like undramatic the way we uh, got together, but it was kind of like, you're dope, I'm dope let's be together. And um, we've been together ever since. So the funny thing is we <laughs> always talk about like our kind of origin stories is like, you know, the sacred and the profane from that exotic erotic ball to them being like at a monastery and then locking it down. So anyway. Oh, uh, I love that. I love that. You know, I love duality so much and just like all of that. And then the vulnerability, I think there's something special when you really see a person in different states you get to love them and different variations of them. I think that is so powerful, especially for people to hear. Um, I think sometimes you feel like you have to be perfect or people. I know I sometimes feel like I have to be perfect in a relationship. And I feel like being real and authentic and vulnerable is really when I feel most connected and what I really respect to when I see relationships where there's just a lot of vulnerability and you can tell both people are just authentically comfortable and they authentically feel safe around each other. So thank you for sharing that sweet story. I can't wait to meet your wife. Um, hopefully someday we can do like a double date or uh, I'm actually going to start doing retreats. So I'm going to invite you and her. I don't know if you do those much, but I'm going to invite y'all out. Sure. So I want to kind of get into um, your book, you know, I feel like it, there's so much that you offer. And what we talked about in the first the first time we filmed is just your intention and your goal behind the book. So can you start there and kind of take us through the journey of what you're really bringing out, what your intentions was when you started and how that evolved over time up until now? Sure. Well, I can't talk about Black Food, um, which is the flagship publication of my new publishing imprint, Four Color Books, a uh, division of Penguin Random House and Ten Speed Press. Um, I can't talk about that book without talking about the residency. The you know I, I've been the resident chef at the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco since 2015 now. And so the former executive director, Linda Harrison, brought me on to create programming that address health, food and farming issues because she really wanted to, the museum to be more than just, you know, a space for exhibiting fine arts. She really saw it as a, a space for community building, a space for education and a space, a safe space in a city such as San Francisco that has seen such a rapid out migration of black folks over the past uh, several decades. So. We created this program together and, you know, immediately I knew that we were on to something. I knew that, um, you know, there was a, a pun intended hunger for this type of programming because uh, we had this, our, our, the flagship program that we did was called Black Women, Food and Power. And I brought together some scholars, um, you know, food activists, some authors. There's actually a 
scholar farmer, Gail Myers, who's an anthropologist and a farmer. Um, and we had this riveting program that looked at the historical and contemporary role of Black women in the production, the distribution and consumption of um, food and food knowledge, because there are some scholars on the panel. And, you know, it was just exciting uh, to see the program sell out immediately. Um, I knew that this program would resonate beyond people who lived in the Bay Area. Like I expected that we might have some people driving up from L.A. Um, you know, the fact that we pe had people coming in from the Pacific Northwest wasn't too surprising. But when I um, discovered that there were people from the East Coast who were flying into the Bay Area for our, you know, afternoon of programming, it really let me know that we were onto something and that this is an important intervention that we were making in um, not just the museum space, but, you know, really inspiring institutions around the globe to think about ways in which they can include food programming, whether they're an institution that focuses on health, food, farming, you know, all these issues that um, I've been working on, you know, just knowing that we all eat, we all have a stake in a healthy, just and sustainable uh, food system, and that there should be space in these institutions to talk about these issues, to build community around these issues. And so, um, and you know, to this day, we still get, you know, messages weekly from institutions around the world who found out about our program and who want to, if not create some wholesale kind of, um, you know, replicating the model and creating their own chef in residence program, um, at least thinking more deeply about how they can have more programming around these issues and um, really being inspired by what we've done here. So, you know, like there are literally, the chapters in the book, there, there are a few chapters that are pulled from the, you know, the name and obviously the content of the programming we did at the museum from the Black Women Food and Power chapter to the Black Queer Food chapter to the Land Liberation and Food Justice uh, chapter. These are all programs that we did in real life. And, you know, I, I had always been thinking about how we could take this brilliant and thought provoking and magical program uh, programming at our small but mighty museum in San Francisco and share with the world. But it's kind of something I just put on the back burner because, you know, this was 2015 when we started. We didn't have the infrastructure for doing uh, virtual programming. And, and the ethos was, you know, if you come to the program, you get a chance to, or the museum, you get a chance to experience the program that time and that moment. But then if you don't, you just come to the next program. So fast forward to 2020, uh, post Breonna Taylor and George Floyd state murders, uh, the subsequent, you know, racial reckoning that this country was facing. And I, I really was clear that I wanted to do more than just, you know, go on the family caravan protests that we were doing or, you know, allotting my philanthropic dollars to certain organizations that I wanted to support. And I knew that um, there was more I can do because what I did was I asked my I asked myself a question that I often ask audiences when I'm speaking um, at different you know colleges and conferences and community events. And the question I ask is, how can you be an activist? How can you understand yourself as an activist and understand the role that you can play? in pushing back against fighting, dismantling many of these structural inequalities that um, harm and, and marginalize communities. Um, and just think about what will, what will be the best way for you to do that? Because I want people to like imagine activism outside of just like on the ground, kind of like, um, you know, confrontational protests in the streets or uh, grass, roots, base building. And to be clear, those things I think are the foundation of and the cornerstone of movement building. But everyone can't be in the streets like that. You know, everyone um, may not be able to play that role, but 
maybe you can, you know, volunteer your time to support these community organizations that have been doing this um, important work for decades or longer. Maybe you can allot your philanthropic giving to organizations that are doing radical work to disrupt these systems. And so in that moment, you know, I decided that what I could do is use my power and platform and, 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 and privilege and position uh, to create this book that is com composed of voices of Black people throughout the diaspora, that has zero concern for the white gaze, that really speaks to our, our magic, our brilliance, our agency, our joy, all the things that um, have helped us survive and thrive. And so, um, you know, we pitched this, my literary agent and I pitched this book to um, my publisher. They immediately bought it. And then on the heels of that, we we're like, OK, we're hot now. Like, we ain't got what we asked for. Let's ask for something else. So we, we had always had the vision of me having my own publishing imprint. And so we um, pitched that as well. And we got our publishing imprint. And so we um, were able to bring this book into the world along with birthing this publishing imprint, Four Color Books, whose aim is to um, really support many of the historical, historically marginalized voices and ensure that their pathways uh, into food media and publishing. So uh, yeah, that's the origin story of Black Food. Oh, I absolutely love that. I love that. And I love just how you just don't take no for an answer and pave your own way and therefore paving the way for so many um, people coming behind you who have been marginalized and oppressed. How, I, mean, I guess, I don't know if you could share this. Are you working with different people right now with the imprint um, now that your your book is out into the world? Yeah, we have a stellar team. It's me um, as the editor in chief. There is my um, creative director, Amanda Yee, um, who you know was born in Oakland, raised in the States, but who's currently based in Berlin. There is um, Ashara Ekundayo, uh, artist, curator, community builder, who's, ba who's between Oakland and Detroit. Uh, she's our cultural strategist. I don't know if there's any other publishing imprint that has a cultural strategist, but mm. one of the things that I, one of the first things I did was bring her on because I wanted to ensure that, you know, we're doing work that is, we're, we're, we're staying accountable to communities. We're doing work that's culturally relevant. Um, and we're just staying on the cutting edge of, um, you know, art and culture and, you know, really speaking to the people um, in, in the most effective ways as possible. And then there's my lead editor, uh, then, um, Kelly Snowden at 10 Speed Press. So we have an amazing team. We've acquired uh, four books already. Uh, we have two books coming out in 2023, uh, another two in 2024. And we're really, you know, starting just tight. You know, I think for me, I don't want to, I, I want to like have a gradual growth. I don't want to try to do everything at once. I think this is a period where I'm learning. I'm learning how to be a publisher. There's a big learning curve for me. Um, we're building our infrastructure. We're determining what our values are. Um, so this year is really about us just focusing within and determining who we want to be in the world and what's our brand identity and, you know, with whom do we uh, want to work. And, you know, we're also really seeing ourselves as a media company and doing work to um, produce our own media. And we're doing projects that are going to be moving into the fine art space. So that's going to be you know, this year, um, but then next year we'll be hitting the ground running with um, our new books. And so I'm really excited. Uh, I hope that this inspires others to think about, you know, how you can take your own um, thriving career and then use that to, you know, help others. And I, I always talk about me standing on the shoulders of the ancestors who came before me. I give thanks to all the mentors mm -hmm. over the years who've guided me and, and helped me to develop, you know, abund an abundant career. And I really want to pay it forward. And I've been doing this, you know, since I started uh, publishing um, in 2006 with my first book, Grub, 
you know, I knew that there was such a paucity of black people in the publishing industry. And I had, I was lucky enough to have some brilliant mentors like Francis Moore LaPay, who wrote the uh, seminal book, Die for a Small Planet um, in the 1970s and, and others. And so, you know, I said that, yeah, I need to pay it forward. I'm going to do all that I can to um, keep the door open, open doors and keep it open for many of the up and coming creators of color. And, um, you know, now I have more resources and more power to uh, support these folks. And I'm just really excited about what the future brings. That is phenomenal. Absolutely amazing. And thank you so much for the work that you do in paving the way and creating space for mm -hmm. more people to, to shine as just like insanely amazing and I kind of want to go back to your your childhood and how you grew up and what really got you into uh wanting to be um in the food space in the first place sure I mean you know I grew up in Memphis Tennessee I'm born and bred and I've been thinking a lot about I, I often think about just the creative brilliance um, that comes from that city and many of the people who are either born there who have somehow, you know, come through there. Um, Ida B. Wells has been a major inspiration for me all my life. You know, she, um, is, she isn't from Memphis, but she, um, cause she's from Mississippi, but she had spent time there when she was doing a lot of her journalism and anti-lynching activism. And, um, you know, at, at one point, Cause I've always like seen myself kind of stepping into be, like this kind of confluence of art and activism. So the funny thing is I remember in college when I got my first email account and it was Hotmail. I don't know if you remember Hotmail. You remember mm -hmm. Hotmail? Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm in the same bracket as you. Yeah. <laughs> I had a Hotmail account. So it was funny because I was kind of embarrassed to like, I was like, Hotmail, that sounds kind of pornographic. I don't know. It's weird. I don't, I don't even know if I want to tell people I have a Hotmail account. But my first <laughs> email account was um, Ida B. Gordon at Hotmail.com. It was inspired by um, Ida B. Wells and my adoration of her and her work and uh, the photographer Gordon Parks. And um, just the inspiration that he's had on me in terms of just like, you know, art and capturing Black life. So, um, yeah, I think about Ida B. Wells. I think about my cousin, this uh, brilliant dancer, uh, Lil Buck. He's one of the pioneers of this dance style from Memphis called uh, Memphis Jookin. And, you know, I just feel like I feel so blessed to be from such, you know, a, a fertile, creative um, city. And so, um, you know, that's where I'm from. And, but before that, I'm from rural Mississippi and Tennessee and Arkansas, where many of my family members live before migrating into the city. And I just feel so privileged to have grown up with a family who had agrarian roots in the rural South, who, you know, brought the survival traditions, the you know, agrarian knowledge, the desire to, you know, grow their own food in the city. And that was what I grew up around. I grew up with, you know, my paternal, I grew up in my paternal grandfather's urban farm in his backyard because it was so much more than a garden because every bit of available space in that backyard was being used to grow food. I remember this was, he had a, you know, this is when satellites were ascendant in terms of like, you know, when you get your satellite, you get like a hundred channels. And I just remember he had a section in the backyard where his satellite dish was this huge satellite dish. And it was just surrounded by dark leafy greens, collards, mustards, turnips, kale. And, you know, he was pecan tree, walnut tree. He was growing muscadine grapes. He had an apple tree. He had all types of you know, diversity of uh, fruits and vegetables. At one point, he had a hog back there. He had chickens back there. You know, this, this is my granddad was country. And I love <laughs> that I got to experience that, that ethos and just that, that, that way of living. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, spending a lot of time in my maternal grandmother's kitchen. Um, I, I, I'd say that is what inspired me to just be comfortable cooking. You know, being with my grandfather inspired me to be comfortable cooking because 
you know, he was a manly man. He was like a carpenter by trade. He kept his shotgun in his truck all the time and he would whoop your <laughs> ass. But he was so gentle and sweet. You know, my grandmother had a stroke um, when I was around three. And so I had grown up just seeing her in a wheelchair, pretty much unable to do many things for herself. And my grandfather took care of her every need. And he was such a loving and committed um, husband. And he would cook for her all the time. You know, the kitchen's always been a very gendered space um, in the, the home, the domestic sphere. It's often kind of framed as like the woman's space. And we know that kitchens in the professional world, uh, professional kitchens are often, you know, male dominated, hyper masculine and, and many times very violent spaces. So to see my grandfather not just doing the typical like barbecuing or whatever the kind of like um, ways in which men can engage with cooking that are seen as manly still, like he would be making her breakfast and lunch and dinner. Mm. And I think as a young black man who had to deal with like a lot of these masculinous um kind of expectations, it gave me permission just to be soft and just to be like, yeah, I'm about to go make some cupcakes and it's all good. <laughs> my granddad would be making cake or whatever. And so mm -hmm. big up to um, my papa, Andrew Johnson Terry, the first for, um, you know, being a great example and just giving me permission to um, just experiment in the kitchen. But in terms of learning um, a lot in the kitchen. I would say it was my maternal grandmother and, you know, she had a kitchen garden as well and a mini orchard in her backyard with peach trees and plum trees and pear trees. And she was so generous in letting me be by her side often in the kitchen and, you know, doing whatever little tasks she wanted me to do from cleaning, you know, greens before she cooked them to, you know, stirring her, um, when she's making her preserves, when she's added her like, you know, fruit and the sugar and just kind of watching it and stirring it to like, you know, turning the lids on the can canning jars before she processed and boiled them. And so, um, you know, my blood ancestors have so much to do with the foundation that, um, you know, when I talk about all these issues, I always say that I'm not talking about anything new. I'm simply sharing many of the, the best practices and lessons that I learned as a child and, you know, kind of repackaging them for a modern, modern audience. But um, this is just, these are old lessons. These are old practices. And these are things that I was lucky enough to um, be able to, to learn from my family as a child. Oh, I love that. This just made me warm and tingly all over. I think it's so important that, you know, people understand that men and women and the gender roles and things like that don't have to be. And we all have masculine and feminine energy and how if we nurture both of those sides of ourselves, we can really grow and thrive. So thank you so much for, for bringing that out and also stepping into your power um, and, and saying, hey, I'm going to show up here and I'm going to do the work that I'm I'm divinely led to do no matter what. And I feel like people are moving more into that space now. Um more and more. I mean, there's still very much uh, we got a lot of work to do, but a yeah. lot of work to do, a lot of work to do there. But I think people like yourself give other men permission to say, hey, you know, it is manly to cook or not even manly. It is OK. I'm not going to be looked at or I don't have to feel differently because I want to make cupcakes and I want to make breakfast and I want to make something that's not on the grill. Mm -hmm. So I just think that that the more people see those representations, just like we need representation as black people, I think it's important that men see themselves in the more jobs and in places where people, or women are mostly seen and also women see themselves in places which are predominantly masculine. And I think that having the those gender roles start to mix and people just see that there is infinite possibilities so they can choose without feeling like, oh, if I'm going to do this thing, then it's going to be looked at as I'm different or uh, something's wrong with me. And I feel like those are the kind of norms that we need to break down and we need to give people permission to just be and follow their hearts and their souls, no matter where it leads them and just kind of crack all of those gender roles. So. 
For sure. We just need to be aware of, you know, these things often work very quietly. We don't even realize that we were reproducing these um, systems. I'll tell you something funny, even in our house, um, our 10 year old and, you know, obviously, yeah, of course you say this because she's our 10 year old, but um, you know, it just had been this way that kind of at dinner, I defaulted towards sitting at the head of the table and then my wife would sit on, you know, one side with my youngest daughter and then my older daughter would sit across from them. And then one day my um, oldest daughter was like, you know, I, I think it's kind of patriarchal that you always sit at the head of the table because, <laughs> you know, why? Why shouldn't I sit there? Why should mama sit there? <laughs> so, you know, for a second, I was just like, well, I just like it. This is, I feel like I can stretch out. But, you know, I had to step back and I realized that, yeah, like there might be something to that. And so we uh, kind of instituted this new um, system where you have to earn your place at the head of the table. So if you cook dinner that night, then you get to sit at the head of the table. And so oh. it's been kind of cool because it's also incentivized the girls wanting to cook more because they're like, I get to sit at the table, <laughs> the head of the table tonight. So anyway, all that to say is um, I think, you know, we can all, um, you know, it's never too late to uh, just change our habits and, and attitudes and, and do things differently. I love that. I love that so much, not only because it's just beautiful to um, have that moment of like connection with your daughter, but also that you're like, hey, you know, let me develop a new system that actually encourage and incentivizing them doing more for themselves and more for the family. And I think that's powerful on both of those fronts is saying, oh, we, we can change things up. Let's let's see how this flows. And then also here's an opportunity for you to kind of earn your place because that's how the world is. It's done, nothing is necessarily given to you. And the fact that you didn't just, you know, not only you did give it, but also you created a system of growth. And I feel like that really does mirror the world. And when you have that in family structures that you mirror and like things aren't necessarily just given, sometimes they are, but a lot of times when you work for them, you actually appreciate them even more. So thank you for that story. I think some people are going to be following your footsteps and take, that's such a good thing to do. <laughs> Whoever makes, I, I'm the kind of person, if I make the food, I want someone else to wash the dishes. <laughs> so sure. That's one thing that I, learn from being with my grandma because she did make most of the meals and I, I wash most of the dishes but I, I do think a, a system in place to have someone else washing the dishes would have been would have been great um speaking of that um what are some other things that you um would encourage especially as you're raising a very aware uh, family structure what are some of the more things that you do that you feel like can really help um, specifically um, families who have, you know, um, just a, maybe a tougher dynamic to how to instill values um, that can help them in the real world? Sure. Well, I think one of the, the most important things, which, you know, our family has certainly been on a journey on is healing generational traumas mm -hmm. and being aware that we so often pass down these traumas unknowingly, you know, just through um, the way that we live and not knowing that these are like, you know, toxic behaviors or, you know, things that can be harmful that our parents did and their parents did. So doing that work and um, it's been just powerful being on a journey as a family and knowing that we have a lot to heal um, as parents and um, just really modeling. I, you know, we've, since I became a parent, I've always been aware that the most powerful parent, parenting tool is modeling. You can say whatever you want, but they're watching your every move and the way that you live and move through the world, then that's how they're going to, you know, move and live to live and move through the world as well. And so, you know, that, that, that self-work is, is key. You know, I, I think um, for me coming from the South and, you know, coming from a family who was staunch Catholic, there's just a lot of norms that were in our family that, you know, seemed to make sense at the time. That was a kind of internal logic of the way that my family 
um, lived and moved. But then, you know, as an adult, there's some things I'm like, that just, it doesn't make sense or it was harmful or clearly this was something that people just did out of habit or because they were told you do things, that that's how you do things. And so I'm just in a process of constantly, um, you know, kind of ruminating on my own childhood, thinking about um, things that worked and, you know, wanting to just celebrate those and, and, and keep those and thinking about the things that I'm very clear um, just don't work or that I don't want to incorporate into my parenting style because I don't think that that's uh, the way that I want to raise my children. And so that's been powerful. Um, you know, whatever, just we are who we are. We're an activist family. We're a, we, a family who embraces radical politics. We're an artistic family. Um, we are who we are. And I think, you know, our, our children are so creative and brilliant and good people because that's who we strive to be. And we know we aren't perfect. And I think the thing that is, is so powerful about, you know, my wife's and my journey is that we're just like, we got to constantly reinvent ourselves. We have to constantly do work to be better people. You know, there is no resting on one's laurels. Um, we need to just like, understand that we can always, you know, go deeper and, and be better and smarter and faster and stronger. And I think for our girls to see that, it's just so powerful because they know that, you know, the, the work never um, stops. Uh, the the self-work, the self-growth is a lifelong process. Um, and, you know, if I, if I would just boil it down to anything, I just would say it's about modeling and really figuring out what being the best person that you can be means for you and being that and then being on this journey with your children and also understanding that, you know, children can be teachers as well. I, I feel like my children are my most important teachers. They're a mirror of who I am. They see me in ways that no one else can see me. They'll call me out in a second. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they... And it's because we open it, you know, we, we invite it. We're open to them um, critiquing us or calling us on our BS or calling us um, out when we are being contradictory or whatever. And so I, I learned so much from them and just tried not to be in this like, oh, I'm the parent and you're the child. I mean, obviously there are moments where it has to be like that. But I think um, just being open to this reality that I have as much to learn from you as you have to learn from me and um, let's teach each other. Mm, that is phenomenal. That is so phenomenal and beautiful. And I think that, you know, you, you know, people, whatever they see, whatever children see, they are modeling themselves after the good, the bad, and the in-between and all the things. And so I think that's just so powerful. I know I grew up, it was like, because I told you so, you know, and there was a lot that I had to unlearn because my parents, you know, first of all, they did a phenomenal job. I'm grateful I'm the woman that I am today because of them. And, but I learned a lot of lessons that I had to unlearn because of being born in the South. And I'm sure you can relate to some of those things of like, you know, you know, just discipline, you know, I got whoopings with a belt, <laughs> you know, um, growing up and, you know, we were separated. We were, our family was separated from uh, my mom, my um, mom and dad's family. So I didn't have a lot of sense of community mm -hmm. growing up. So I, he really had to learn a lot when it came to community, when it came to discipline, when it came to anger, rage, fear, fear that um, I feel like you said, if it's modeled in a certain way, that's what you're picking up. That's what you're absorbing as a child. And then you have to decide as you grow, like, am I, what am I going to keep and what am I going to transition? So, and I also love that you said that you learn as much as from your children as they learn from you, because I feel like that as a spiritual being, children come through and they have this this pure spirit and that if you are willing, you can learn from a child at any age from out of the womb all the way through um, just as much as we can learn from nature. So I just wanted to just like affirm that because I feel like it's such an empowerful point. 
Sure. And to your point around like corporal punishment, we embrace a, a parenting philosophy called positive discipline. And I think, you know, the cornerstone of this parenting model is that shame, shaming and blaming and isolating and punishing children, it doesn't work. It may work in the short term. You know, if you have a kid and they're doing something and you shame, blame, punish, yeah, it might stop that behavior. But what it also does is it instills fear. It starts to chip away at their self-esteem. Um, it doesn't create empowered uh, adults, uh, empowered people who are going to be empowered adults. And so, you know, we, like I said, I mean, similar to you growing up in the South, like I got whoopings and I was very clear that I didn't want to in like go near any type of corporal punishment um, with my children. And then coming into this uh, positive discipline, parenting philosophy, just re philosophy really helped organize, you know, different things that I was like, I want to like, you know, try to be a parent in this way. And I want to like approach it in this way. And it's just like such an empowering way for us to think about um, dealing with our children, but just dealing with each other and just, you know, really puts in the, I think it's helped me understand how we have such a carceral um, mindset in this society. And, you know, I mean, there are a lot of obvious reasons why this permeates this society, but, you know, just like no one is, no one should be punished and shamed and blamed and isolated. You know, there's so many different models that we've seen in cultures throughout the world where you can hold people accountable. You know, mm -hmm. people need to like own up to when they're causing harm. But, you know, this idea that, you know, just that we see at its worst in our incarceration system, that when people make mistakes, um, no matter how heinous they might be, um, locking them in a cage you know, putting someone in um, uh, isolation for 23 hours a day, that's cruel, it's inhumane. And I think that, um, you know, hitting a child is cruel and inhumane, you know, and a lot of people disagree with that. They're like, yeah, you should, the kids don't understand. You need to hit them sometimes to get them to understand. They don't understand what you're trying. They understand that if I do something, I'm afraid that I might get beat. So I'm not going to do it, but you need to get deeper and really help children understand how life works. And so, um, yeah, it's just been, exciting um, encountering these different um, ideas and going to workshops and you know we had a positive discipline coach for about a year who was really supporting us in our parenting journey and so you know it, it I the thing that has been exciting to me is knowing that you just can't like if you think that you know how to parent just because you were parented that is just not how things work. I mean, there's so much to learn and there's so many teachers and guides and books and other um, tools that we can take advantage of to help us be better parents, just like we might take advantage of to help us be a better athlete or a scholar or anything else. So, you know, like everything else, I, I see parenting as a constant journey in which I'm learning and growing. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that. That is so powerful, so powerful, so necessary. And I think it's it has to be part of the conversation because we have to do things differently. Um, we have a fear based society. And so we are part of the problem. And unless we decide to do things that are not fear based, we're going to keep getting the same results. So thank you so much for being part of that healing um, and also mirroring that in your family and also speaking to it because it's a place where, especially in our culture as black people, we're like, oh, you know, it's for the wide school of the child. And, and we have these, these terms and these ways of thinking that are ingrained in our consciousness. And even, you know, I've had so many conversations when it gets to the seven, it's like, oh, it depends on the child. And it's just, you know, um, and then we talk about systems of oppression and how we're trying to change that. It's like, wait a minute, if we don't change it in our family, how are we going to change it in the world? And um, I just see those two as like very, very similar. It's like what you do to yourself, what you do to your others and your family, and then what we're doing in the world. And so if we cannot change or think to change the culture and where 
the way we think about punishment and how, you know, if you do a bad thing, doesn't mean you're a bad person. It means we need to talk about this thing that you did and how it's harmful to yourself and others. And uh, just thank you for touching on that. I didn't know how passionate I was about it until just then, but it, um, I've always been passionate about, um, you know, the corporal punishment and even the death penalty and things like that. I'm like, it makes no sense. It's never made sense to me. And I, I'm glad that we, you know, I didn't even plan this for this conversation, but I'm glad that we're touching on it because I feel like it needs to be talked about more. I think the more you have conversation about a thing and see here different perspectives and how harmful it is to take a life because of, you know, retaliation um, and how that that doesn't make sense, you know, and, and things like that. I think the more that we talk about it and share different perspectives, the more that people can think about, hmm, do I want to continue and perpetuate that type of uh, reality? We need to collectively, as Black people specifically, talk about these things and the ways in which, like, you know, the institution of slavery and the way that we have were hit, disciplined and punishments or even beyond that Jim Crow or even the prison industrial complex, how that impacts the way that, you know, we interact with our communities and families. And I hear so many people saying like, well, you know, I used to get beat when I was growing up and I'm OK. And I'm just like, no, you're not. <laughs> you think it's OK to beat a child. You're not OK. You know, and so I think the more that we can just like do this introspection and recognize that these larger systems and histories have impacted the way that we interact with each other. Um, I, I think then, it, you know, it, it'll get us closer to healing. So. Mm, I say, and you're not okay because you're a beat. You you're okay because you were resilient. Mm -hmm. And that is what it is across the board It's the resiliency um, that makes us be okay. Not the fact of the, the, punishment and the abuse and, the, um, you know, all those, the guilting and the shaming. Um, so thank you so much for, uh, I, I, I'm definitely down to keep having that conversation until we start to see like how we can love and how we can teach. And so kind of going on a little bit more with that, how do you feel a way that we as a community, we hit on this a little bit before, we as a, a community can come together and start to educate um, ourselves, our family and moving out? And what are some of the resources that you're leaning into that you can share with us? Uh, and what specific area? I think in the area, I mean, we did get off the topic for food in a we little bit. We kind of digressed in the like. <laughs> <We did. laughs> I mean, and that's how this podcast is. It's very organic. Um, but let's start with the food. Let's 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 not diverge too much. Let's start with the food because I feel like the food is a huge piece. Every day we have to eat. So how can we change our mindset around food for the healing and the growth and expansion of humanity? I think the first thing we need to understand that a lot of th this idea that we're autonomous and making a lot of the decisions around what we consume, um, it's just erroneous because so many of the decisions are being made for us. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like, I remember when there was this ad in like the late nineties and it was like, you know, a Coke and a Mountain, it was like Pepsi and a Mountain Dew and a Dasani. It was whatever. It was like all these different like drinks that were all made by the Pepsi corporation. And it was like, you know, look at all the choices. They're not choices. They're just like these choices that are presented by this one corporation. And there's this illusion of choice, but the choices are already made for you. And I think that, you know, in an industrialized food system, that's largely controlled by, um, you know, a handful of multinational corporations, we need to understand that so much of the way that the food is grown, the way that it's transported, the way that it's cooked, the way that it's presented to us, these are decisions that are made by a, a small handful of people. And I think that it's important for us to understand that in terms of like improving our community health, improving, um, you know, overall well-being, we need to uh, disrupt these systems. Um, I think that, you know, we, we just have to question um, an economic system that um, 
you know, prizes. I, I'll put it like this. I mean, look, we need to be organizing against capitalism. I'm just going to say it. Like, if people don't understand that capitalism is not like, oh, I want to be able to, I, you know, if I just work hard, I can make enough money. Capitalism is about these institutions that are concentrating so much wealth and making so many decisions about these systems that, you know, we have to push back against them. When you think about the fact that there are like five multinational corporations that control the majority of our food system, what that means is, I mean, the reality is, is that they their only allegiance is to increasing profits for their shareholders. Right. And right. so they're all about the money. If there's some kind of like, you know, new market that they can go into, like I, I always think about like the fact that, you know, veganism has been like growing exponentially, you know, like across the board. I am. It's exciting that the fastest growing population of vegans in the country are African-Americans, especially given that so many, the ways in which we imagine like veganism, it's everything but black folks. And we know that there's a history of black folks, you know, this thread throughout the 20th century of black led food and health activism that, um, you know, just disproves that. But anyway, I, I guess the point that I'm making is that, you know, these companies, they have very little, um, stake in addressing labor issues. They have very little stake in addressing environmental issues. They have very little stake in addressing animal welfare. And so what that means is we can't continue to see these institutions, these corporations as the primary ways in which we feed ourselves. And I just think that if the past two years have taught us um, anything, I, I hope it will have taught us that, you know, this government, isn't going to save us. Capitalism isn't going to save us. I mean, if you think about the inept response that the U.S. government has had just to this, this public health crisis that we've seen, I think it's just symbolic of the inept response to all the ways in which they have failed to care for its citizens and the people living in this land. And so I think we just have to be of the mind frame that, look, we need to be taking care of ourselves. We have to be creating institutions outside of this current economic system that are going to care for us, that are going to help us thrive, that are going to give us ownership, that are going to ensure that, you know, our families, are, our, our communities, our families, our communities um, are, are whole, are fed, are, are well taken care of. And, and, and you know, I, I guess... What's underlying a lot of this is I just see so much emphasis on social media when it comes to like veganism around just like consumer based interactions. It's like buy this, go get these products, get this processed package vegan thing. And, and, you know, you can have a vegan diet and have a shitty diet. You can have a diet replete with processed and packaged foods. That doesn't mean that it's going to be good for your overall health and well-being. But it also, you know, those type of diets where we're buying our food from these corporate supermarkets and these institutions that are in our communities, but don't care about our communities and have some corporate headquarters way off. You know, Malcolm X talked about how, you know, when you have these businesses that are owned and run by people outside of the community, at the end of the day, that person, that man, as Malcolm said, would take that bag of money back to his community. So I'm just really trying to figure out, um, not just me, I'm seeing, you know, examples and models around the country and the world where people are thinking about alternative economies, thinking people are thinking about um, alternative ownership models of, you know, businesses. People are thinking about um, different ways of feeding our communities that don't rely on um, enriching, you know, the, the, the shareholders of these corporations. So I just think we need to divest from capitalism. I'm going to put it like that. Like, we need to just think about the harm that this extractive system has done to our communities, to this earth, and, and, and beyond that, and know that it's broken and it hadn't been working. And I don't know if we can fix it, but I do know that we can create alternatives that will be much more um, um, just healing and nurturing and abundant than um, what we've been used to. I love that. I absolutely agree. We can try. 
We can definitely try. And you have not only been trying, you've been succeeding. And I, I just really, really love, love, love all the books you've created. I mean, goodness, how many books do you have now? Five, six? Well, I have. Um, so my first book was co-written with my um, friend and colleague, Anna LaPay. And then I have five that I've written beyond that. So six in total. Thanks. Awesome. Well, congratulations. Um, Y'all check out Brian Terry, check out all of his books. I mean, I don't know which one's my favorite. Um, I think when we met, we met on a vegan cruise and um, what book were you coming out with at that time? I think it was. That was probably Vegan Soul Kitchen. Or maybe it was, no, because this was, I think it was Afro-vegan, probably. It was Afro-vegan. It was Afro-vegan. So I guess that's my favorite because that's when I was first introduced to you. But I mean, so many great books um, out there. So um, if you're listening, go check them all out. And I know you will fall in love like I did. Um, And before we head out, I mean, I I could talk to you for another hour, um, but I know you have to run. And I just want you to share with us kind of your... I want to say your biggest mantra or word you want to share with people mm-hmm. at this time. Um, it's not a word, but it's a, it's a phrase, if you will. And um, the phrase, before I tell you the phrase, the, the kind of shorthand um, is PMA. And that stands for positive mental attitude. Mm. And I first encountered this philosophy by uh, this personal development, self-help guru, I guess, if you want to look at him like that, Napoleon Hill, uh, who wrote this book, Think and Grow Rich, which is, you know, a major inspiration for me. And, you know, I think, you know, immediately you might think it's just about financial abundance, but, you know, that's the title to get you into the, the, the door, into the book, but it's about just you know, thinking abundantly in all areas of our lives. And, you know, this idea of just having a positive mental attitude and how that will just, you know, create a lens to which we see everything. And in addition to Napoleon Hill, so inspired by Napoleon Hill as well, there um, is this uh, seminal punk rock band called Bad Brains. And they have a song called PMA. And it's like, you know, they're, they're this black punk band from DC. And the song is like, you know, just punk rock. And don't care about what they say. We got that attitude. Don't care about what they do. We got that attitude. Da, 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 da. We got that PMA. <laughs> and they're just like, this is wild, like just punk rock song talking about having a positive mental attitude. And like, mm. sometimes when I'm just like in a funk, I'll put that on. And just kind of like wild out in my backyard. And it just like puts me right where I want to be. So I try to hold that every day. Just like have a positive mental attitude and not like, you know, whatever. I think I can balance kind of like having a sober analysis or understanding of like all the violence and trauma and madness and harm and everything going on in the world. But I often think about, this um, phrase, I think it was Lao Tzu in the Tao Te Ching, or maybe it was the Buddha. It was, one of, it was either, I, I'm pretty sure it was Lao Tzu, but anyway, it's this idea of there being 10,000 joys and 10,000 sorrows all happening simultaneously. And I really try to hold that because, you know, as you and I are sitting here having this conversation, there are horrible atrocities happening in my city, in your city, in the country, in the globe. Like, there's always crazy, just violent, harmful things happening. And they're always beautiful and, you know, just wonderful things going on at the same time. So I think it's about recognizing that we can hold both. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's about understanding that what I focus my energy on is going to shape the way that I see the world and kind of shape my reality. So I try to always um, maintain that PMA. 
I love that. Thank you so much. This has been such a treat to talk to you again. Thank you for being so patient, so loving, so forgiving, and just always showing up um, for me, you know, as a positive inspiration to me and also a positive inspiration for our community. I appreciate you so much. Thank you. Such a pleasure being in conversation with you, Koya. Awesome. Well, what can people find you and get all your books? Yeah, I mean, you can find me on Beyonce's internet at <laughs> www.bryant-terry.com. Social media, Bryant Terry, B-R-Y-A-N-T-T-E-R-R-Y. I'm really just on Instagram. I mean, I have different accounts on Pinterest and TikTok, but where I'm most um, active is Instagram. And um, yeah, you know, uh, if you could do one thing to support, I, I would say buy, if, if you have a copy of Black Food, great. If you, I'd encourage you to get one, but, you know, more than buy one for yourself, if you could buy a copy of Black Food for a young person in your life, mm. um, especially if they're interested in like food and food activism and ag issues, like all the things that we cover in this brilliant book, give it to a young person. You know, I, when I was in culinary school, there, I was the one, the only black male in my cohort. And I just, because of the Eurocentric nature of culinary education um, in the States um, and it's focus on like, you know, French brigade, brigade system and, you know, just these Europe, Western European um, cooking approaches. I just felt like I needed inspiration. I needed to find someone who, you know, chefs that I could aspire to be like. And that's when I first encountered uh, Edna Lewis in her work through her book, uh, A Taste of Country Cooking. And so that just really helped put some wind under my wings and inspire me to keep going. And, and when I was putting together Black Food, I was definitely thinking about many of the budding food creatives and chefs and folks who are just trying to make their way in this field. So I would say chefs and food creatives of African descent and really, you know, just hoping that we would create a book that would be inspiring to them and, and, and help put some wing, some wind under their wings as well. So, um, you know, buy it for a young person in your life and I'm sure they'll thank you later. I love that. Well, I'm about to order a copy and send it to my niece who I know will really enjoy it. Um, so I hope that you all do the same thing as well. Thank you so much for being here today. And thank you all for listening. If you haven't yet done it already, uh, leave a review. Let us know what you like, what you didn't like. Um, if you're not following Brian on social media, um, check him out, give him a follow. Um, also tag us with your biggest takeaways let us know we're here to serve and we're here to um, make impact so um, let us know what you like and until next time love yourself love others and love the world one day at a time one breath at a time peace and love <laughs> i just want to take a moment to say thank you for being part of the get loved up community i like to share topics and people making a positive impact in the world and your feedback means the world to me if you haven't already left a review, please leave a five-star review and let me know what you want to hear more of on the show. I'm here for you, and together, we're making the world a better place, one day at a time, one show at a time. Thank you for listening.